most high, most mighty, and most excellent monarch, Elizabeth II. The final goodbye to the Queen. One woman can touch the world and provide, you know, love and grace. A service in the same majestic space as the Queen's coronation and the marriage to her beloved Philip. Memories and thanks along the funeral route. I'm now asking this question, what is permanent? What is stability? May she rest in perfect peace. Tonight, she is buried at Windsor, and her son must chart his own course as king. The title and burden he holds, she carried for most of a lifetime. This is The National in London with Chief Correspondent Adrian Arsenault. Thank you for being with us. We are in central London tonight overlooking Trafalgar Square. After 10 days of quiet and reflection, it is busy and noisy again, even in the middle of the night, as the city and this country begins a whole new era. This day, of course, was devoted to saying a final goodbye to Queen Elizabeth II. It was a regal send-off in every sense, and it all appeared to go to plan. Now that it's over, so is the 10-day period of public mourning. The royal family will continue theirs for another week, a reminder that this very public event has roots in very private grief. From procession to procession to yet another procession, that goodbye went on for hours here in London and in Windsor. Margaret Evans shows us the pomp and precision that accompanied the Queen on her final journey. This was a day of heavy tread, etching itself into old stone and the chronicles of history. Britain's farewell for a queen like no other. Elizabeth II's coffin was born to Westminster Abbey by 142 Royal Navy sailors on a ceremonial gun carriage. The mourning party once more led by her four children. Hundreds of world leaders and dignitaries attended the state funeral, testament to the Queen's global reach. Despite the soaring grandeur of the service, the Archbishop of Canterbury sought to define the simple qualities of the woman behind the crown. In all cases, those who serve will be loved and remembered when those who cling to power and privileges are long forgotten. Also in the Abbey, British Prime Ministers passed, one of whom once described the Queen as a golden thread running through the generations. The root of her funeral cortege seemed to weave a final tapestry. Young and old crowding the avenues and places so familiar to the Queen during a 70-year reign. People watched the funeral on their phones as they waited for the procession to reach them. After more than a week of official mourning, the drum beat of the funeral dirge is by now familiar. It was very emotional. I think despite seeing the last few days of preparation, I've, I felt definitely a lump in my throat when she went past. It makes you realize she's been there all our life and will ever be the same again. The first glimpse of the funeral procession for many came in a flash of red, Royal Canadian Mounted Police at its head. Some members of the Order of Canada were also guests at the funeral, part of Canada's delegation. But the moment for me was the first time I sang God Save the King, and I actually made a mistake. Like just out of my mouth came, at the very end when I stopped reading the lyrics, came God Save the Queen, because it was so natural and intuitive. And I actually like kind of burst into a, a little moment of tears at that. Just sort of thought, wow, I need to catch up. 
When the procession reached Hyde Park Corner and the Wellington Arch, the Queen's coffin was transferred to a hearse, one last journey to make, a homecoming of sorts at Windsor Castle, and another service, this one at St. George's Chapel, smaller, more intimate, and more finite, as the instruments of state presented to the Queen at her coronation were removed from the coffin as it was lowered into the royal vault for a private burial later, a lone piper playing a lament slowly disappeared from view, like a last glimpse of the queen herself. The mourners inside left to sing the national anthem. King Charles, now the new monarch, but also a son laying his mother to rest. So Margaret, ever since, you know, the stunning news of the Queen's death, people have just been busy. You know, there was planning to do, there was mourning to happen, and I suppose now everyone is confronting the matter of, of what next. That's right. It's like, it's like the country has been on hold. And I met some trepidation um, out in the crowds, you know. People are worried about losing this link that was a link between generations, and she was so linked to Britain's global identity. People are worried that King Charles might not be able to carry that off. On the other hand, you would meet people who would say, if the Queen were here, she would say, get on with it. And that's what they've got to do. All right, he has his work cut out for him. Margaret, Indeed. thank you. Thanks for having me. As you just heard, the Archbishop of Canterbury described the Queen's life today as one of service. Here's a bit more of what he had to say in his sermon at Westminster Abbey. Her late majesty famously declared on a 21st birthday broadcast that her whole life would be dedicated to serving the nation and commonwealth. Rarely has such a promise been so well kept. And we pray today especially for all her family, grieving as every family at a funeral including so many families around the world who have themselves lost someone recently. But in this family's case, doing so in the brightest spotlight. May God heal their sorrow. While well, today's funeral followed many royal traditions, it was also deeply personal. We're going to bring you the meaning of some of those touches throughout the show. The Queen played a major role in planning it all, and the ceremony reflected so many of her passions, including her deep respect for the RCMP. At the Queen's request, members of the RCMP took on a special role in today's procession. Five Mounties, four of them on horseback, led the procession of the Queen's casket through the streets of London to Wellington Arch. The horses also significant. They were gifts to the Queen from the RCMP. They were part of the Platinum Jubilee events just in June, some ridden by royals. Following behind the RCMP with other Commonwealth forces were 84 members of the Canadian Armed Forces from 16 units across the country selected for their special relationship with the Queen. As Margaret mentioned, the procession ended at Windsor Castle, a place that has always mattered to the Queen and to the royal family. Chris Brown is there tonight. Chris? Adrian, this royal town has witnessed countless uh, memorable moments in the thousand years since its famous castle was built, but perhaps none as momentous as today. Windsor's part in the Queen's long farewell was perhaps more intimate than the scenes of grand pageantry in central London. Some who spent the night here said they did so because of their personal connection to her. We've seen her quite a few times. So, yes, it's like we are neighbours. It sounds very cheesy to say that she was a neighbour because that sounds quite personal, but it, it was. You'll see her driving past on the way to church. We've seen her horse riding in the grounds. Windsor was one of the Queen's favourite places. A young Princess Elizabeth spent much of the Second World War at Windsor Castle. But in the end, all will be well. 
rallying the country with broadcasts on the radio. Many years later, when it burned in 1992, she appeared devastated. It was the site of many happy family weddings, but also the saddest occasions. The image of her alone in the chapel during COVID, mourning the death of her husband, Prince Philip, moved a nation. On screens along the long walk, mourners watched the service in London, waiting patiently for her final journey to reach Windsor. The planes taking off from nearby Heathrow Airport were suspended this afternoon so that the procession could take place in silence. As the casket passed, those gathered were profoundly moved. You know, she's an amazing lady. She's been around all my life. I never met the woman. Why am I upset? I don't know, but I am. Others said the moment signified transition. She's actually gone and you acknowledge that now as, as she passes by. It's like the end of it now. It, you know, it's closing another chapter, isn't it? Also waiting patiently, the Queen's black pony, Emma, who was brought to watch the procession from the grass. And two beloved corgis were there when her coffin arrived at the castle. At the conclusion of this very public day of spectacle, the final moments were held in private in a ceremony only for family. The Queen's wishes were to be buried with her husband of 73 years, Prince Philip. And so they were, next to her father, King George VI, her mother and sister, Princess Margaret. Chris, you had that extraordinary privilege of, of being in the crowd. What stood out for you? Well, just the number of times, Adrian, people would tell me that they just thought they'd never see anything like this happen again in their lifetime, and they really wanted to be there to witness it, to be a part of history. In fact, one 15-year-old girl told me that she thought they were going to write books and textbooks about uh, what happened today, and she wanted to be able to tell her kids and her grandkids uh, that she was there. This event was hugely unifying for everyone who was there to witness it, uh, and I think it really made people feel proud. Adrian. All right. Chris Brown in Windsor, England. Thank you, Chris. Those same feelings of pride and deep attachment felt across the ocean in Canada. As Kayla Hounsell shows us, many people got up early to witness the pageantry and to say their own farewell. It was something Pearl Kavanaugh just could not miss. And it's, it's very sad and I'm very touched. And I don't know if I'll ever get over it. Born in Guyana, then a British colony, 96 years ago, in the same year as Queen Elizabeth, she feels a special connection to the monarch. She was like a sister to me, even though I've never met her. Her niece moved to tears. <laughs> I remember mom. Because the Anglican ceremony so closely resembled her mother's funeral service. She prepared an English breakfast fit for a queen. Well, this represents our British heritage, and this is one way of being close to the Queen at this time. Here you go, Mom. Here's a nice cup of tea. In Alberta, Rita Irvin brought her mom home so they could watch together. I'm in my 60s, and, and she has been on the throne since I was born, and it's, it's, it's just hard. I'm really doing this in honor to my mom because she was so English. In living rooms and kitchens across the country, Canadians woke early to mourn their monarch. It's emotional, and it's history. In Newfoundland, Carla Conway has collected royal memorabilia since she was a child. I felt it was the need to be involved in some small way to watch it, because she was our queen. At this historic theater in St. John, New Brunswick, visited by then Prince Charles in 1996, people came together to watch. An opportunity that once in a lifetime to see a funeral of this stature uh, on the big screen. In Halifax, a 21-gun salute. Part of a nationwide send-off that along with pomp and pageantry included quiet moments of mourning. No, it's hard to express my feeling, but, uh, but we all have to go. With some families finding it hard to let go of a queen who felt like family. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. Remarkable.
Canadians also remembered the Queen at an event in Ottawa. Echoes of the British ceremonies. Marina von Stackelberg was there. A chilly, rainy afternoon in downtown Ottawa. Weather as solemn as the parade that made its way past Parliament Hill. Mounties on horseback and members of the Canadian Armed Forces marked the death of the monarch. Michael and Paula Webster are visiting from the UK. It's very sad. It's the end of an era. Yeah, we've lost our mother. <laughs> yeah, it's quite emotional. <laughs> At Christchurch Cathedral, leaders from across the political spectrum sat side by side. A choir sang the same hymn from the Queen's coronation 70 years ago. She visited Canada 23 times, more than any other country in the Commonwealth. During her very first visit in 1951, she noted, from the moment when I set foot at first on Canadian soil, the feeling of strangeness went, for I knew myself to be not only amongst friends, but amongst fellow countrymen. Canadian musical tributes included music sung in English, French, and Cree. Queen, her gentleness, her ability to emotionally connect with the common people, her desire to make the world cleaner and safer are truths she carries with her now into the great land of souls. The life and reign of Elizabeth II has been witness to our struggle, our efforts as Canadians to become what we are meant to be, the true the North, the free. Her Majesty remembered as an observer to half this country's history, as Rufus Wainwright performed Leonard Cohen's renowned song, Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. The gun salutes, the songs, the solemn tributes were heard across Canada as provinces remembered the Queen in their own way. I pray that she felt totally filled with the love of all the people she touched in her life on Earth. Her reign is a reminder of the providence of God that may lead us to places we never imagined for ourselves. Ninety-six is a long what, you know, we owe her. <laughs> yeah. She showed a genuine interest in the people of this land and a firm belief in our future. Eternal rest grant unto her, O Lord, and may light perpetual shine upon her. And may God save the King. We have much more to come on this historic day here in the UK, but we are also keeping an eye on some other news, including... Hurricane Fiona's devastating path. We're still in the middle of this um, event. We're basically responding at this point. Up next, after catastrophic damage to Puerto Rico, where it's headed now, plus. We'll reflect on the Queen's funeral, tradition on display, but also what was new. They showed the world a vision of who they want to be, the monarchy. Coming up, my conversation with historian Dan Snow, and a little later, Canada's ties to the royal family and the new king, of course. A relationship with the monarchy and the treaty relationship will last as long as the sun shines. The close Canadian connection to Charles III, we're back in two. Like so much of today's funeral, the music chosen for the ceremony in Westminster Abbey was deeply significant, some of it specifically picked by the Queen. This hymn is called The Lord's My Shepherd. It was sung at the Queen's wedding to the Duke of Edinburgh in the same abbey in 1947.
this hymn called Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, also carries deep meaning for the royal family with this arrangement first heard in 2011 at the wedding of William and Kate. This is O Taste and See, which was composed for Elizabeth's coronation in 1953. And there was a new piece specifically composed for the Queen's funeral. And according to Buckingham Palace, it was inspired by the Queen's unwavering Christian faith. We come to you from a changed London tonight, out of the official mourning period, under the reign of a new king. We have much more coverage for you of the historic day that unfolded here, but first, we want to bring you some of the other important stories developing tonight. Hurricane Fiona has made landfall in the Dominican Republic after slamming heavy rains down in Puerto Rico. Cameron McIntosh shows us the catastrophic damage from flooding that could last for days. As it made landfall, the season's first major hurricane, Fiona, walloped the Eastern Dominican Republic. At my age, I've never seen anything like this before, says this man. I have no words to describe this. The storm flooding roads, toppling trees, tearing through just about everything in its path. It destroyed everything, he says. Everything has been affected. It all has to be rebuilt. All of this. Hitting popular beaches and resorts, many tourists had to be moved further inland. Fiona has already swept across Puerto Rico, packing 140 kilometer an hour winds, leaving a similar trail of destruction, forcing thousands to flee to shelters. I decided to come here to stay alive and safe, this man says. Heavy rain in some places up to 76 centimeters is causing record flooding. That's a bridge put in place after Hurricane Maria, which hit five years ago this week, killing 3,000, destroying the power grid. Again, power is out for millions. In some places, drinking water is scarce. Still, officials say they learned from 2017. Supplies have been stashed around the island. While still catastrophic, the early assessment, the damage isn't as bad. We're still in the middle of this um, um, uh, event. We're basically responding at this point. Um, the next step will be recovery. We're not there yet. As people scramble for essentials, it'll take a long time. The entire island is under a state of emergency. The Federal Emergency Management Agency is on its way, aided by others. We'll have over 100 troopers from the New York State Police Department on their way to Puerto Rico uh, over this next week. Meanwhile, the storm is expected to gain power as it tracks north towards Turks and Caicos and Bermuda. Cameron McIntosh, CBC News, Winnipeg. And Western Mexico is cleaning up tonight after a 7.6 magnitude earthquake. The tremors sent residents out into the streets looking for some safety. There are no initial reports of significant structural damage. This happens to be the anniversary of two devastating earthquakes in Mexico. In 1985, thousands of people died, and in 2017, 350 people were killed. Now, a riot at a Vancouver hip-hop music festival over the weekend has now led to arrests and property damage. Oh my this chaotic scene was captured at Breakout Fest on Sunday after festival headliner Little Baby cancelled his appearance due to an illness half an hour before he was scheduled to appear. Police then arrested seven for breaching the peace. Little Baby and the venue apologized to fans and the city. And Moscow has summoned the Canadian ambassador calling for more protection at the Russian embassy in Ottawa. You see, the Russian foreign ministry says police were alerted that a Molotov cocktail was thrown onto the embassy grounds. It did not ignite. There was some strong reaction today to comments from the U.S. president broadcast last night. Joe Biden declared the pandemic over. As Katie Simpson shows us, many in the medical community disagree. It's never a great day for a leader when your comments require clarification. As President Joe Biden returns to the U.S., 
That is the predicament he faces. I think the president was reflecting what so many Americans are feeling and thinking. At a booster shot clinic, the Health and Human Services Secretary walked back Biden's statement that the pandemic is over. We still must be aware. While the chief medical advisor to the president did the same. We are not where we need to be if we're going to be able to, quote, live with the virus because we know we're not going to eradicate it. Biden was touring the Detroit Auto Show last week when he made the remarks during an interview with the news program 60 Minutes, which didn't air until Sunday night. Is the pandemic over? The pandemic is over. We still have a problem with COVID. We're still doing a lot of work on it. Uh, it's but the pandemic is over. If you notice, no one's wearing masks. Everybody seems to be in pretty good shape. And so I think it's changing. And I think this is a perfect example of it. The U.S. is averaging 391 daily COVID deaths, a dramatic drop from the worst of the pandemic. And while outcomes have improved, Biden's words are being seen as deeply unhelpful. The biggest concern is it's not true. The pandemic is 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 still very much uh, with us. In the there is worry. Biden's dismissal of the pandemic will hurt vaccination efforts. Why would parents want to vaccinate their kids? Why would adults want to take their boosters if if the president is saying that the pandemic's over? Biden's comments do not appear to signal any sort of change at the White House. The COVID strategy will reportedly stay the same and the public health emergency remains in effect. Katie Simpson, CBC News, Washington. There's a major new development tonight in a U.S. murder case at the center of a popular podcast, Serial. <laughs> that is Adnan Syed today after a judge overturned his murder conviction. He spent 23 years in prison since being found guilty of killing his ex-girlfriend in 1999. His case gained widespread attention in 2014 when the podcast raised doubts about his guilt. Syed has been ordered into home detention while prosecutors decide whether to seek a new trial. After the break, we have much more ahead on the Queen's funeral, including my conversation with historian Dan Snow. It was all painstakingly put together to present a certain vision of the monarchy and a vision of Britain. Coming up, how today's ceremony spoke to both the past and the future of the monarchy. Plus, the strong ties between the new King Charles and Canada. We are overlooking Trafalgar Square tonight in central London as the city begins its return to its noisy normal after 10 days of official mourning. Queen Elizabeth's funeral ended just hours ago, and in a first for a British monarch, it was televised live, giving the public a view of all the pageantry and symbolism involved. Stoic and symbolic every step of the way, as Queen Elizabeth's coffin moved from Westminster Hall to Westminster Abbey. To Windsor, personal and powerful symbols moved with it, resting on top. A floral wreath spoke to Queen Elizabeth the person, the flowers chosen by her son, King Charles. Rosemary for remembrance and myrtle grown from a sprig the queen carried in her wedding bouquet. The card read, in loving and devoted memory, Charles R. But with it sat symbols that are unmistakably royal, the imperial state crown with nearly 3,000 diamonds, sapphires, rubies, emeralds, and pearls. And the sovereign's orb and scepter, the first symbolizing the Christian world, the other power and justice. But they are not with the coffin now. They were removed at the end of the committal service, replaced with a regimental flag added by King Charles and this. The wand of service of the most senior official in the royal household, broken to signify the end of his service to the queen. So much meaning, centuries of history in the ceremony and rituals we just saw. Dan Snow, the popular British historian, was at my side today to help explain that. And afterwards, I asked him to reflect on what all that spectacle might mean to the people of Britain, as well as the challenges ahead for king and country. So Dan, as everyone is piling out, 
it's over, they're going home, they're thinking about it. What are you thinking about what you saw? I'm thinking about so many aspects, things I've just read about in history books that I've now seen with my own eyes for the first time. I'm thinking about how choreographed it was. They gave us a vision, they showed the world a vision of who they wanted to be, the monarchy. Um, I was thinking about the things that are new, the, the woman in command of the, the sailors who were pulling the, uh, the gun carriage, the, the prayers from the female Bishop of London, other women in, in Westminster Abbey, the first time ever at a, a royal funeral. I'm thinking about the Catholic cardinal who gave prayers at the royal, at the royal funeral, only metres away from where Queen Elizabeth I lay, the great champion of Protestantism. I'm also thinking about how you can't fake that, that the popularity of the, the former Queen. Those lines, those huge numbers of people that came down to pay their last respects as the car was whizzing towards Windsor. That was unchoreographed. They couldn't fake that. And there were hundreds of thousands of people. She mattered to people here in the UK. And as you, as you talked about sort of the women, all of that, as you said, was choreographed. That was all sending a message. It's all there to send a message. Uh, the, the prayers chosen, the songs, the people doing the readings, you hear from people, the, the, the importance of the Commonwealth, the prominence of the Canadians, the RCMP, Trudeau being invited to all the events, uh, the prominence of Scotland within it, because as you know, within the UK at the moment, there's a battle for whether Scotland will re remain part of the UK. It was all painstakingly put together to present a certain vision of the monarchy and a vision of Britain. This is not the, just the end of a reign. Is it arguably also the end of an age? I think it is the end of an age. I think Elizabeth saw us through, well, through the age of, of space travel, of the internet, of the, the multiplying of the Earth's population. I mean, Elizabeth, there's a lot that's happened in the last 70 years. But also she saw Britain through an age when it went from being in a position of global predominance, global hegemony. The British Empire was still intact when she was young, when she was a child. It no longer is. And she helped Britain to come to terms with playing a smaller part in the world, being a, being a smaller player. And so at, at this point, you know, as the veil is lifting, right, the, the, that veil of, of lace of mourning is lifting. When the king wakes up in the morning and he surveys his kingdom, he surveys his, the world, this country in particular, what kind of world is, is he looking at? For the first time ever, we have a new prime minister and a new king in the same week. So both of them are going to be blinking into the daylight tomorrow morning and they're going to realize they have a very full entree. There is an energy crisis here in the UK. There is a crisis of constitutional crisis around Ireland, Northern Ireland, Scotland's place in the UK. Our relations with Europe, uh, we have um, a whole, we're going through some big changes at the moment. Now we have a change of monarch on top of that, and Charles has to work out what kind of monarchy he wants to be, and the rest of us have to work out what kind of Britain we want this to be. It is going to be a busy year or two. And he has the crown, but not necessarily the built-in respect or, or admiration. That has to be earned. He is. You're, you're so right. He's got that crown now, but does he have the love and affection of his, of his people like his mother did? The next six months are going to be very important. And he's going, to have to, he's going to have to make plans around his coronation. He has to capture the public mood. It can't be, out of, it can't be too jarring. Spend too much money or not enough and people will think it's a failure. You've got to do just the right thing. Uh, and he's going to, he, hasn't got long to, he hasn't got long to build that legacy because he's a man in his 70s. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be tricky. All right, Dan Snow, as always, thank you. Thank Thanks you. for being with us today. Thank you so much. Canada's delegation to the Queen's funeral included leaders and luminaries, of course, but also many citizens who've made contributions to this country. We caught up with one such delegate to hear what it was like to be at such a historic farewell. I could feel my heart bound in a way of walking through them doors and seeing all the different levels and people of the world making your way through the church and, you know, you have your eye-to-eye -eye contacts with some of the people. I'm Leslie Arthur Palmer, first officer of the Canadian Coast Guard, retired. I'm part of the Canadian delegation to witness the service for the Queen. In 2006, I received the Cross of Valor Award for Canada. This was an incident that was a fishing vessel that had flipped over in heavy seas and icing conditions on the west coast. Basically hypothermic in very poor condition 
you have that feeling to push on and to help somebody else. It's a real humbling experience. All I can say is that, you know, it's been a real honor to, to represent Canada and to be here to witness the service for the Queen. And as we got to the location we were sitting down, I realized, you know, just how important this is. All of a sudden you start hearing the music playing, the trumpets playing, and seeing the Queen's family coming in there, you know, your, your heart goes out for the family. But when the bagpipes start playing, it's always, always hits home. To tell you the truth, I was at the uh, Bravery Awards in Ottawa last week, and I thought that was a real honor to, to witness that and to, you know, to hear other people's experiences and what they did to get their medals. And then coming home back to Prince Rupert and then receiving the call to, would I be willing to go to London and to be part of the service. I couldn't believe that uh, I was invited. A remarkable front row seat to history and he earned that seat. Now to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, Charles made only one trip abroad and it was to Canada. We wrapped him in the star blanket. Coming up next, where Canada's relationship with the new king stands and where it could go from here. From the streets and parks of London to the gates of Windsor Castle, the size of the crowds gathered for the Queen were overwhelming and many amidst them overwhelmed. It's surreal. It's never thought I would be able to do this. When I came home from work the other day, it was like, let's go, you know, let's go, let's, let's go there and be a part of this, this little bit of history. To feel the guns, to be there with all the other people. There was a point at which a thousand people or so watching the screen here suddenly all stood up and clapped. There was no planning, no prompting for that. They just all did that. Those of us who parents are not around, some of us saw her as a mother, our children saw her as a grandmother. It's like a unifying loss of our Queen. We have heard that so often from people as they mourn this loss. For King Charles, of course, that is a reality as he begins his reign. J.P. Tasker takes a closer look at his ties to Canada and how he's forged some special bonds through charity and outreach. When Charles touched down in Ottawa in 1996, he arrived alone. Separated from Diana and on the verge of divorce, Charles was on his first solo tour in years. Palace aides were worried about how he'd be received. But Canadians seemed to embrace him at this low point in his personal life. There were adoring fans at every stop. I can't believe it happened. It's like the best experience of my entire life. This plant shop on the outskirts of Ottawa is a world away from the gilded halls of Buckingham Palace. The rare tropical plants you'll find inside wouldn't survive in the British countryside. But the woman behind this small business thanks King Charles for her success. A wounded veteran, Kristen Topping started Sweet Life Flora after she got a helping hand from the Prince's Trust charity. If I hadn't had this opportunity, I probably would have gone down a path that would have been detrimental to my health. So what he's actually doing is he's telling people there are other options out there. This is at Windsor Castle. Now a booming business, the King recently flew her to the UK to award her success. It's funny because he came up to me, he's like, ah, oh, I recognize you. He's like, the green hair does it. <laughs> Charles made only one trip abroad to mark the late Queen's Platinum Jubilee. He came here to Canada, a sign of respect for a favoured member of the Commonwealth, and he reconnected with an old friend. This former Assembly of First Nations National Chief has known Charles for more than 20 years. So that's the picture. Perry Bellegarde was on hand when the King got a Cree name, a recognition of his special relationship with First Nations people in Canada. And then we wrapped him in the star blanket. It's sun watches over him in a good way. So that was captured in 2001. It's an unlikely friendship. Belgard, a lifelong anti-colonialist, and Charles, now king of an empire. But Belgard says many First Nations have an attachment to the crown, 
and any move to abolish the monarchy here will have to go through them first. Elected leaders come and go, but our relationship with the monarchy and the treaty relationship will last as long as the sun shines, the rivers flow and the grass grows. Like old friendships, Charles's connection to Canada will evolve, and he'll maintain those ties with more visits to a country he says he loves. J.P. Tasker, CBC News, Ottawa. And when we return, we'll look back one more time on the day that was. Coming up, the sights, the sounds, and the emotions as Queen Elizabeth was laid to rest. A purple catafalque in Westminster's Great Hall has been the heart of a nation's homage to a beloved sovereign King George VI died in 1952, instantly making his oldest daughter, Elizabeth, queen. Just like she would be seven decades later, he was brought to lie in state at Westminster Hall. And when he left... A king leaving his capital forever. It was atop the very same gun carriage used today. The atmosphere then, just as still, just as somber. But of course, instead of mourning, now Queen Elizabeth is being mourned. A mile-long procession escorts the coffin, carrying the symbols of majesty. Seventy years ago, a procession led the coffin of King George VI on his way to St. George's Chapel in Windsor, the place where today his daughter once again joined him as she was laid to rest. Now those images, the movements, the military processions, the settings all drive home a crucial point. How much history is woven into all the ceremony we saw, to, saw today. And more history was made too. A British monarch's funeral has now been broadcast live on television. The world has watched. Let's take another look. Few leaders receive the outpouring of love that we have seen. She was joyful, present to so many, touching a multitude of lives. It's been a privilege to be here with you over this stretch, to witness this moment, to feel the stillness of this country, that silence that came with respect and tradition. Canada's new king now must work to build the relationships and the trust that do not come automatically with the role he now inhabits. 
we will all be watching that. And that is a national for September the 19th. Thank you for being with us and good night from London.